Okay, so let's talk about realistic playwrights. Um, I introduced these four fabulous bearded gentlemen to you already, and we're going to focus now on Ibsen. All right, and this is Ibsen. Look at that face. Okay, so Ibsen is born in 1828 and dies in 1906. He is Norwegian. Um, Northern Europe got associated really early with uh, the realistic movement because of Ibsen and Strindberg, who's also from Northern Europe. He's Swedish. And Northern Europe was sort of seen as more intellectual uh, in the late 19th century, and perhaps that's why we have these playwrights coming out of that part of Europe being more engaged in this new, new kind of writing. Um, Ibsen had a long career as a playwright. He had a very celebrated career as a playwright. Uh, he was a um, beloved son of Norway. Um, Norwegians are proud of Ibsen as their uh, theatrical and literary heritage, kind of like a Shakespeare or a, uh, a Racine or Moliere in other parts of Europe. Um, He's painted a lot, so I could show you lots and lots of paintings of him. He's a subject of photography. He's a subject of essays in his period. He was seen as intellectual, innovative, a little radical. Some people didn't like him. Some people loved him. Um, there was a phrase or a term in the period, which was Ibsenism, which kind of meant like the new realistic plays, uh, but they used his name to describe them. We don't do that anymore. We just call it realism. But Ibsenism was the thing that people said in the late 19th century. So he's huge. He's a really important writer. And I want you to know that he didn't write just plays like a dollhouse. He wrote a lot of um, different kinds of forms of dramatic literature. You don't have to know all of this, okay? Um, but I, I, this is by way of example, okay? So we can think of Ibsen as having three big types of plays or types of writing in his um, body of work. Um, he wrote romantic and historical plays. That's one thing he wrote. These are particularly popular in Norway. They're really not that popular outside of Norway, except for Per Gint. Um, they're very, very popular in Northern Europe, however. He wrote plays that are historical about Northern Europe, like the Vikings of Hilgeland. Um, he wrote plays that take place in older centuries of Northern Europe, like Brand and Peer Gint. And he wrote these very romantic, think of all the things you know about romanticism, think about what uh, Victor Hugo said in the preface to Cromwell about what romantic plays should be like. That's what these plays are like, okay? So he wrote in this form, and um, these are, are, are quite well studied and very, very popular on the stage in Northern Europe. He also wrote realistic plays, right? That's why we're talking about him. And there's the three biggest that you should know. He wrote others, but you should know A Dollhouse Ghosts, and Ghosts, plural, and Head a Gobbler. Um, later, in another lecture, I'll mention why I insist on calling it a dollhouse instead of a doll's house. But you'll see I have a habit of doing that, and I'm kind of attached to calling it a dollhouse, not a doll's house. Um, but I'll mention that in a later lecture. Be on the lookout for it. And then the third kind of play that Ibsen wrote, um, we would lump together as something like symbolic and mystical plays. These are quite unusual works of dramatic literature. They are not realism, although at times some of the dialogue might seem like it. Um, they're not simply romantic plays, although some of the sensibilities in them might remind you of romanticism. Um, they are plays which are very intentionally using poetry, symbolism, um, sort of uh, otherworldly characters or story plots. Um, Things that are uh, supernatural show up in these plays. Things that are inexplicable show up in these plays. In realism, we don't see things that are inexplicable. We see a world that's quite explicable. But in the symbolic and mystical plays of Ibsen and other Europeans in the period, uh, we are shown a kind of glimpse of the world as infused with the supernatural. Uh, this is sort of uh, proto-surreal. Um, Ibsen writes in this vein also, and, and we might call his play The Wild Duck. It's definitely symbolic, 
The Lady from the Sea is mystical. And When We Dead Awaken is kind of a non-realistic mystical play as well. So he even writes plays like that. All of that to say, when you think of Ibsen, I know it will be your lifelong habit when you think of Ibsen, and I'm sure you will think of him often, it will be your lifelong habit to think of him as a realistic playwright. You'll think of a dollhouse. That's great. But one part of your brain should always remember that he also wrote other kinds of plays. Um, so he's a prolific and varied writer and worth a lot of um, celebration, which he gets. If you hear any weird sounds in the background, by the way, the doodles have decided to come and wrestle right next to where I am recording this lecture. So the dog sounds are them. Okay, next. Oh, yeah, here he is. So here's our brother Ibsen. Uh, he writes these three very important realistic plays, A Dollhouse, Ghost, and Head of Gobbler. Um, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about A Dollhouse. At another lecture, I'm going to emphasize a few important things about ghosts. And we aren't going to spend any time on Head of Gobbler, but gosh, it's a good play. And you should really, really read it. Um, and Hedda is a fantastic and troubling and always interesting character. Um, somebody that actresses really always want to grapple with is Hedda Gobbler. Uh, so those are um, his three great realistic plays that you should know. And we're going to um, favor a dollhouse in our class discussion because that's the one that you're reading. And here's uh, a couple of images from early productions of a dollhouse. This is a photo. Yeah, a photo, right? From the world premiere of the play, which was in Copenhagen, Denmark, not in Norway. It was first performed in Denmark. Uh, and it was performed December 21st, 1879. If you haven't already read the play, you may not know that it is set at Christmas time. So it's interesting really interesting that it premiered also at Christmas time. So I want you to imagine that for audiences who were there for the original night of a dollhouse, that what they saw on the stage looked like the world around them in every way possible. It was a normal, nice house with people who were contemporary, wearing normal, nice clothes. It wasn't set in another world. It wasn't set in a historical milieu. It wasn't fantasy. It was a romantic history uh, and it was set sort of now, right now at Christmas time. So it had this immediacy, right? That gave it a lot of power and a lot of potency. Um, no accident at all that it was uh, set around Christmas and also premiered around Christmas. I also want you to know that about two weeks before the first production, first performance of A Dollhouse, there was a print run of about 8,000 copies of the play and they sold out right away. That means that in Copenhagen and in some other major cities in Northern Europe, critics were reading the play before they went to go see it. That's interesting, right? Um, it means that the play was sort of identified as being important before it even hit the stage. And that means that people who saw it for the first time, critics, intellectuals who saw it for the first time uh, had already read it and so were ready to say something about it. That's maybe why we get quick, um, very cogent newspaper criticism of the play um, pretty, pretty early on. It's because they were reading it and, and preparing themselves for this unusual play before they even um, sat in the theater. It's going to be another two years, though, that before this play gets performed outside of Northern Europe, outside of Scandinavia and Germany. Um, it's not going to be performed in France until uh, 1894. It opens in 1879, so that's a long time. What is that, 15 years? Um, it was, here's another picture of the play for you. Um, it was initially banned in England and the U.S. It was seen as just too much and inappropriate. Uh, the original text, like in its original form, was forbidden to be performed. Um, now, we know there's no censorship in the U.S., so the ban was on decency laws. Dogs, stop. It was on decency laws um, and also sort of self-censorship. The theaters didn't want to be the ones to do this radical play. They did, however, do a version of the play that had been adapted by playwright Henry Arthur Jones and a team of them, Henry Arthur Jones and Henry Herman. Uh, they wrote an adaptation of it, which they called Breaking a Butterfly, Breaking a Butterfly. And um, that was produced 
And people knew that it was a version of a dollhouse, but not a dollhouse. And after you read the play, we'll talk a little bit about what was different. I bet you can guess when you read it. Um, there were two private productions of the play in London. In its original form as written, I mean to say private, not against the sort of um, mandate not to do the play because it was private, um, wasn't in a public theater. But it, they, it did happen on, for two private productions in London uh, in the form that Ibsen actually wrote. So there were a few people in London seeing the play in its original form and not just reading it. And that's kind of interesting. And you want to know something really cool? In one of those two private London productions, George Bernard Shaw played Krogstad, um, sort of the nemesis to um, Nora. So that's interesting. But it's going to be like 10 years before a, a, a real version of the play, unedited, unadapted, is seen in a public theater in England or America. Um, and as you know, one of the first people to play Nora in the U.S. was our friend Minnie Madden Fisk, um, who originated Nora, the, the, the most important public performance of Nora in the U.S. Um, we love Minnie Madden Fisk, don't we?